Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, Julie and I are happy to have one of our favorite guests that we've ever had on our channel. And, and friend. And friend, yes. <laughs> and she's our number one video. Um, you know, we'll probably be passing 200,000 views of her original video here pretty soon that we did four years ago in Ecuador. It's hard to believe we've known Kay for four years. Uh, but we've had her on a couple different videos, actually. Some when we were in Cuenca. And she's been an inspiration. She's a single woman, and she's been traveling and has been all around the world. And a lot of people want to know about single female traveling and how to do it. And do you feel safe? And is solo traveling something that you should embark upon yourself? Yes. So let's go to World Traveler K. Hello. Yeah! So... Fill us in on the last four years. We left you in Cuenca. And we also get a lot of requests about your previous apartment. Do you still have it? Well, my original plans in 2020 when I moved to Ecuador and I met you all was to get my permanent visa and stay in Ecuador, uh, which is why I got the apartment. Uh, but um, there was a problem. Uh, they did some changing in the rules of getting your permanent visa in Ecuador, and I didn't know of the rules, and um, I guess I broke the rules, I was unable to get my permanent visa, so I'm only allowed to be in Ecuador right now for six months out of the year as a tourist, so because of that, I gave my apartment up one year ago this week, uh, because I spend three months in Ecuador, and then I travel for three, and then I go back to Ecuador for three, and I travel for another three. So I didn't want to have to be responsible for an apartment when I wasn't there for six months out of the year. Okay. So where have you been going to these, on these jaunts outside of Ecuador? First off, for a lot of people, being in Ecuador is exciting enough, but you've been jumping around in other places too. Yeah, so each three months that I'm in Ecuador, I plan my next three months out of Ecuador. So I won't go all the way back four years. I'll just go back to this past year. Um, in the spring last year, when I had to leave in March, I spent three months, mm -hmm. went to Netherlands to explore my family heritage, went to Tanzania to do some volunteering, and went to South Africa to do some sightseeing, went back to Ecuador for three months. And then in the fall, when I left again, I actually did a group tour, which I don't normally do, of Nepal and India. Uh, met up with some friends in Greece prior to that and finished up that three months spending six weeks exploring Mexico as a potential second home base uh, in the future before returning to Ecuador for my next three months. I just left last week and this upcoming three months, um, I've got something unique planned. I'm not much of a cruise person. But I found a great deal on a cruise. So I'm doing a cruise for 16 days around Asia, finishing in Japan during the Cherry Blossom Festival. I'm going to stay there for a few weeks and then head to the UK. Uh, only because I've met some friends that live in the UK and keep inviting me to come. And I said, well, why not? So I'm going to be spending about six weeks between England, Scotland, and potentially Ireland before returning to Ecuador for my next three months stint. Wow. And these, you know, these travels seem like they could get really expensive. So I'm assuming you pack with very little, correct? Yes. So I never check a bag. I don't like checking bags because number one, it's expensive. Number two, they can get lost. Number three, I don't like waiting at the conveyor belts. So instead, I only carry... Uh, one bag, I carry a backpack, and then I have a carry-on bag, and most airlines will allow you 10 to 15 kilos, so 22 to 30 pounds, so that's a little on the heavy side, I know, but that's what I try to stay within. Most of the time, it's manageable. I need to know how to do that, <laughs> and uh, so I assume this cruise, you probably got a pretty good deal on it and to make it worthwhile for offering a $2,000 uh, flight credit, but we ended up getting our flights from Seattle to Bali for only $400. So wow. I opted not to go with their travel credit, airline credit, and instead just went with the cruise. And I ended up getting about 65% off of the total price by going through the third party instead of going directly through the cruise line. 
<laughs> which is why I'm doing this cruise. So it's a 16 day cruise through six countries in Asia. And uh, the original price when I looked on the cruise lines website was $9,000, but 2000 of that was flight credit. Mm -hmm. And I ended up getting it for 2,900. Mm -hmm. And that includes our Wi-Fi package. Um, and it's a luxury cruise line. It's not one of the four to 6,000 people cruise lines. It's only 850 people, much smaller boat with more personalized service. Okay. That sounds exciting. So so you're hitting countries I haven't been to, but you've hit a lot of countries I haven't been to. Oh, yeah. Um, because I, I, I think we're at like 40, going 47, 45 here by the end of this yep. this coming summer, I think. And and what where are you with countries now? How many? Um, I've been to 72, but this cruise will take me to three new ones. It'll take me to Taiwan, the Philippines, and Brunei. So in about, before the month is over, I will have gone to 75 countries. So... Something that I find intriguing and amazing about you is you always will find the perfect idea or way to, it's a travel hack, how you afford to stay somewhere, you know, you volunteer, correct? Yes. You do all kinds of things. So I realized um, about five, six, seven years ago, probably started in 2017, that I really, really had a passion for traveling. My kids were grown, married, didn't really need me. So I decided how can I travel as a solo woman, single woman on a single income. And I realized I really couldn't do it through the United States. The cost of living in the United States is too high, which is what brought me to Ecuador. And then that allowed me to be able to live on my social security, but have money left over to travel. But I still have to balance it out with finding those good deals. So for airlines, I will usually look through Hopper or Skyscanner to find the best deals and then find the airline offering that deal and go directly to the airline to book it because it's less problems to do it that way. As far as lodging, um, I usually will start with hostels. Um, I like staying in hostels. I know a lot of people think it's very strange that a middle or I guess now I'm a senior citizen. As of this week, I'm now officially a senior citizen. Um, would stay in a hostel. But I find out that when you stay in hotels, number one, it's expensive, but number two, it's very isolating. When you stay in a hostel, you meet other travelers and you can join them on their adventures and that helps with the loneliness. Uh, they can give you ideas of where they've been or where they're headed or you can get an invitation to join them. So I prefer hostels if it's possible. Um, if I'm traveling with another person, then we would most likely get a private room at a hostel and occasionally go through booking.com and get an apartment, which is good because it gives you room to spread out and also a chance to get your laundry done because a lot of the apartments have washing machines. So very rarely do I ever stay in a hotel. And um, you do volunteer work too, right? Yeah. So I'm always looking for an opportunity of how to save money <laughs> because the more money I can save, the more I can travel. So that's always my goal. So for instance, uh, the three months I was gone this past fall, I had a friend here in Cuenca or in Ecuador looking for an apartment for her and I to share. And she called me one day and she said, what do you think about living and volunteering at a school? And I was like, okay, well, what does that involve? And I hadn't really thought about it before because I'm, I didn't want to teach. I don't want to write lesson plans. That's too time consuming. So what we ended up doing, her and I moved into this school and we only had to have conversations four hours a day with the students. We'd go pull a student out of class and just basically talk to them in English about anything they wanted to talk about. And in exchange for that, I got free room and board for the entire two months that I was at the school. Okay. So that's just one example of volunteering my time in exchange for free room and board. That's fantastic. Your birthday just passed and you said you're a senior citizen. What is the definition age now of a senior citizen? Because sometimes it used to be 55, then it was 62, then it was 65. Um, it goes up constantly. So it just depends if you're trying to get dinner at, or breakfast at Denny's or, or if yeah. you're trying to get some sort of uh, government benefit. It's a solid 65. You're not a senior citizen until you turn 65. In other countries, uh, Asia, Europe, I'm pretty sure it's going to be 62 to 65, which will give you discounts to get into museums and parks, botanical gardens. 
So I'm going to take full advantage. Anytime I travel, I will ask them, do they have a senior citizen discount and take advantage of that for my entrance fee? Also in Ecuador, if you're over 65, you get half price public transportation, including discounts on plane tickets. So I'll be taking advantage of that the next time I go back. So have you hit 65? Yes. I was 65 last week. Wow, you you're incredible. Yeah. I'm telling you, you you just like put me to shame. I think you walk more than <laughs> Yeah, so so we just interviewed a couple that are in their 80s and you know, they're 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 still going. They're down in Turkey at the moment. Um they gave us their story and I can see Kay being somebody going into their 80s with this wonderless. Am I yeah. wrong or do you have an a, an end time coming up with uh, slowing down on your travel? Well, people ask me if I'm going to attempt to get an uh, attempt to get the visa again in Ecuador, the six months I'm there every year. And I said, no, because right now um, I want to travel. And at some point in my future, if I get to a point where physically I'm not able, maybe that'll be in my mid eighties, another 20 years, then I would go back and maybe try to settle somewhere. But for right now, while I'm physically able um, and financially able to travel, I'm going to continue to travel. My goal is 100 countries before I die. And as I said, by the end of the month, I will hit 75 countries. So I'm just gonna keep on moving. And so I'm holding off on countries like Iceland, Scandinavian countries. Uh, Japan was on that list, but this cruise happens to drop me in Japan. So I'm doing it now. So some of the more expensive countries I wanna do in the future. I also would like to see Cuba. I just think Cuba is fascinating. And I would like to go to the Middle East. And that is the one area of the world that I do not think I want to do as a solo woman um, for many reasons. I just think I would feel safer being with someone else or being with a group. So those, that's what's on my bucket list for the next you know, five plus years. And a lot of females are, are nervous about taking off and, and doing this like Warren said in the beginning. Um, now you've been to Azerbaijan. You've been to Tanzania. Uh, she just said it. Been to Georgia. It, has there been anywhere that you have felt uncomfortable, unsafe, place you would never return to? Um, that you you think, wow, I really should not have done this. Um, no, um, I have never felt unsafe anywhere I've gone. I've heard rumors about places, and then I arrive in certain places, and then I'm pleasantly surprised at how nice everybody is. And helpful and I've never really felt unsafe anywhere I've gone um, I don't at this point intend to return to India or Nepal not because they're unsafe but just because it's so chaotic and so crazy and so loud and so overwhelming that I think my two visits to India and my one visit to Nepal was enough the roads are horrendous and so it's it's not physical safety as a woman but it was more safety of being on the roads and the traffic and the high and the driving or or the, the road conditions. So I wouldn't return for that reason. And the only big mistake that I've made in my travels is in Georgia, beautiful country, very impoverished, especially after um, COVID. Um, it was very difficult to find a hotel or a restaurant and anything open. But I was with a friend, we rented a car and I made a mistake of not checking the roads and drove over a mountain pass that wasn't accessible. And it was really, really scary. And that was totally 100% my fault. Um, if you're going to rent a car and you're going to drive in a foreign country, you need to do your research and you need to know what the roads are like before you take off. And I failed to do that in that situation. And I guess that leads into transportation. Uh, you rent cars, you use public buses, you use trains, planes, pretty much everything, right? <laughs> Yeah. So in Europe, obviously, public transportation is really easy to get around, whether or not it's a train or a bus or a short flight. In Japan, I'm going to exclusively be using um, the trains there, with the exception of the one flight to get up to Hokkaido. Um, but other countries, transportation is kind of hit or miss, the accessibility for public transportation. For example, and it depends on the situation. For example, I just spent six weeks in Mexico. And I wanted to visit a lot of places. And my thought was, yeah, there's nice buses in Mexico, really nice buses. And I could get from point A to B to C to D to E. 
then I get off the bus. I got to figure out how to get to my hostel or where I'm staying. And I finally just decided this was an exploratory trip for me. And I wanted to be able to just pull off the side of the road and pull into a small town and check it out if I wanted. So I did rent a car in Mexico. I don't normally rent a car if I'm alone. I'll usually rent a car if I'm with other people and they want to share the cost because car rentals are not cost effective. So I kind of broke my own rule in Mexico, but I will try to primarily use public transportation and only rent a car if it is um, financially feasible. No. But I don't have any fear of driving. I can drive on the other side of the road. I can drive over mountain passes. I spent a month in New Zealand in a camper van 19 or 20 foot long camper van driving in the winter up the mountains on the other side of the road. So nothing scares me when it comes to driving. <laughs> now, you have a lot of friends that you've made through your travels, including us. Uh, you know, you've got a lot of connections and you have kind of a what I kind of look at as a pack of single female women that you've done some adventures with, like I think you did the Camino with a group of women, but there's a, uh, I think you've got a friend, Andrea, that uh, has been on a few adventures where we ran into you and her together in Romania. Um, so you, you travel alone a lot, but you also have made other friends that are similar to you that are single females and they're traveling too. And so there's, you're not just alone with, you're, you're not the only woman out there out there traveling alone. There's others like you. Yeah. The largest growing population of travelers in the world right now are single women. So fortunately, some of the companies like cruise ships or other groups are starting to try to cater to the single women. So for me, I joined a lot of Facebook groups. I joined solo women travelers, girls love travel, host a sister, women over 50 traveling and loving it. And these groups are just a wealth of information and they're so supportive. Um, you, you send out a message saying, I'm coming to such and such place. I'd love to meet some of you. And you get responses. And through this, I was able to stay with four different families in Tanzania last year. So I spent a month in Tanzania staying with families that I met through these Facebook groups, volunteering with them and their organizations for free room and board. And then just now in Mexico, I met a woman through Hostess Sister, stayed with her in her apartment, and I've now referred two other friends to go and stay with her. So I believe like you guys do, you guys are huge in the networking. Everywhere you go, every country, you're always meeting new people, you're networking, and down the road, you run into some of those people again. And so I've learned that from you all of how to network. So for example, I met a girl in Vietnam back in 2018, and she lives in the southern part of England. I met another girl on a beach in Greece last September, and she lives in London. And I met a couple last spring in Turkey, and they live in the northern part of England. So in April, I'm going to be headed to England, and I'm going to be staying with all three of those people. And I met them each on other, other trips in other countries, and kept their contact information, stayed in touch over the years. And now they said, if you ever come to England, please look us up. And I've reached out to all of them in the past week or two, and I will be staying with them while I'm there. So wow. I think networking is a great way to meet people. Like you said, help with the loneliness and the finances. And, you know, something else that really makes people really anxious is when they land somewhere, um, what do they do about their phone? Because their phone suddenly, uh-oh, won't work. What do you do? Yeah. So, you know, you're getting ready to go to Japan, for example. When you get into Japan, what's the plan? So the first thing I do when I get off the plane, while I'm still in the airport, if at all possible, I go to an ATM and get local currency, and I go get a SIM card for my phone. Um, every country I go to, that's what I do. Uh, I was talking with you all earlier. This is a unique situation. I'm getting ready to go through six countries on a cruise ship. So I'm not really sure how I'm going to do this one yet because I'm only in one country for two days, another country for one day, another country for three days. So I may try to download some maps offline while I'm on the cruise ship so that when we're in that one port for the one day, I can just use my offline maps and not buy a SIM card until I get to Japan. At the end, when I get to Japan and I'm there for two, two and a half weeks, I will definitely go buy a SIM card 
uh, to be used for everything while I'm outside of my uh, lodging. It's interesting you brought up offline maps because I was going to ask you, do you uh, do, do that download ahead of time, you know, because you you don't know what you're going to incur. I mean, you your phone might not work. Something might not work. Because when I'm visiting other countries, I buy the SIM card as soon as I land. So I've got it for everything. And I don't have to necessarily worry about downloading offline maps. No, Ecuador, you had an incredibly low budget when we were there before. And, you know, I'm going to put the the screen up here so you can see the previous video that we did with Kay encourage you to go watch this video. Um, have you seen inflation uh, go up? You've been back and forth to Ecuador. Um, what, do you, what do you feel about the prices from when we first spoke with you going on four years ago to the current situation there? Would your budget still hold up? I was saying that I don't think prices have gone up that much in Ecuador. They've gone up a little bit. I've seen it with groceries and rent, but the rent, you can still get a reasonable place. You just need to ask around and not necessarily go off of the gringo websites to find your lodging. Okay. Yeah. We, we've been hearing that there's um, been very, very minimal uh, inflation from the, the folks we've been speaking to, not like what we've seen in America or parts of Europe. And, and so you can get by in social security in Ecuador still. Yes. And and so you go there, you save your money, you can bank some money, and then go off to more expensive places. Yeah. So I know you were asking me previously about my monthly budget. And I don't really have a monthly budget. For me, it's all about balance. So if I spend a lot of money one month, like on the cruise, then the next month I need to have a cheap month. And maybe that's volunteering at a school or some other place. So in me looking at a 12 months instead of a month, one month at a time, looking at the 12 month, it needs to balance. Great. So yeah. now I, I just try to find the best deals while I'm traveling, um, putting in some volunteer time for some free room and board. And now with this new situation in Ecuador, being able to volunteer at the school and they've invited me to come back when I return in July, I can go back to the school again if I want. Let's, let's talk Ecuador real quickly because there's a lot of our viewers have gone to Ecuador or plan to go to Ecuador or followed us since Ecuador. And we just did a uh, an interview with Ed Lindquist of Cuenca Expat Magazine down there. Um, a lot of the news about Ecuador has been somewhat uh, scary. But, you know, if, if you look at U.S. news, it looks pretty scary, too. I think uh, the news is made to make everything look scary. As a female running around and going down to Ecuador, do you feel unsafe? I, you know, there's a lot of negative news. What's what's your what's your take? So, unfortunately, in the four years that I've been there, there has been an increasing presence of drugs traveling, or at least I've been told, drugs traveling from Colombia to Peru, which means they have to go through Ecuador along the coastline. And there are gangs along the coastline that fight for the rights and the money that is associated with those drugs. So because of that, some of the coast, coastal areas have become a little more dangerous. I used to always take the bus from Cuenca to Guayaquil and then from Guayaquil fly to the States. I've quit doing that now in the last 18 months. I now fly to Quito and then from Quito out. So I stay up in the mountains. Everything's fine. There's absolutely zero problems in Cuenca where I live. It's very safe. We have no problems with violence or guns or drugs or any of those things. Everything's very good up there. I just believe there are some kind of scary areas, specifically in the Quito area. So I just try to stay away from there. Okay. Well, Kay, it's been fantastic getting the chance to see you again, getting the chance to hear from you. Um, you know, I I expect we're going to see you in another country here fairly soon. And, you know, we'll go get dinner or lunch or just hang out uh, again somewhere. So at this time, I'd like to thank yeah, everybody for tuning okay. in and joining us today. And as a reminder, Julie and I, we're traveling the world with our two dogs. We're trying to find out what it's like to live in other countries, other places. We're trying to share our experiences, our expenses with you, talking with expats and experts. So we hope you're going to subscribe, give this video a like, and until next time, have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. Ciao.